Hello again, everyone. It's Alexander Platt here from the La Crosse Symphony Orchestra. As always, I am thrilled to come back to La Crosse, I think my favorite city in the world, and to share with you a beautiful program of music in which, once again, I think it's fair to say the LSO will show grace under pressure in bringing you a gorgeous program of great symphonic literature for the more intimate forces of a chamber orchestra of strings and piano. We're going to begin the concert with a kind of ending. As T.S. Eliot said, in our end is our beginning and vice versa. We're going to begin with the slow movement of the very last string quartet of Ludwig van Beethoven, whom, of course, we in La Crosse and the entire musical world had planned to joyously and festively celebrate the 250th anniversary of his birth. Of course, COVID-19 intervened and so many of our plans were ultimately foiled, but we wanted to recognize the genius, the everlasting genius of Beethoven, even though, of course, in this program, we are presenting a smaller and socially distanced group of string instrumentalists on stage at Viterbo. This is the third movement, the slow movement of Beethoven's very last string quartet, the last of his, if ever the phrase were true, magisterial cycle of 16 string quartets, in which he began as a young man in that late Viennese classical style, emulating his teacher, Joseph Haydn, and his idol, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And by the autumn of 1826, when this quartet had been completed, albeit just um, about six months before his death in early 1827, Beethoven was recognized as the crowning genius of a new revolutionary romantic era in music and in all the arts. There is actually a tradition of playing Beethoven's late string quartets as veritable symphonies for string orchestra. The probably the most famous of them is a slightly earlier work, the string quartet Opus 131. That was popularized most by Dimitri Metropolis, which those uh, diehard music lovers in our Cooley region, a name you may know because he was very famously the music director of the Minneapolis Symphony Orchestra in the 1940s, before becoming music director of the New York Philharmonic. Metropolis, in the tradition he had inherited from great conductors like Gustav Mahler, would conduct the Opus 131 string quartet in an arrangement for full string orchestra. His contemporary, the great Italian conductor Arturo Toscanini, however, he specialized in this string quartet. Again, the very last of Beethoven's string quartets, the Quartet in F Major, Opus 135. Both of those renditions, Metropolis with Opus 131, Toscanini with Opus 135, were heard and experienced by that young American conductor named Leonard Bernstein, who would make both quartets part of his performing repertoire in his celebrated concerts with the Vienna Philharmonic late in his career. It would be wonderful, of course, to essay the entire String Quartet Opus 135, but we realized that in the constraints of this program, which of course has no intermission, we wanted to at least give you the immortal slow movement in string orchestra form. Again, this is not some fly-by-night decision of your music director to take a string quartet and somehow jury-rig it into a symphony for string orchestra. This performance is but a recent example of a, a great and long tradition going back to the late 19th century. In adapting this slow movement of, of a string quartet for string orchestra, I have followed the arrangement of the double bass part 
precisely to the beloved and very late recording that Bernstein himself made with the Vienna Philharmonic. This slow movement is, for me, the ultimate expression of late Beethoven. Beethoven surely must have realized that he was nearing the end of his, by the standards of the time, rather long, but profoundly troubled life. And this slow movement, this hymn-like slow movement in the, in the warmest of all possible keys, D flat major, this very restful key signature and kind of sound world is really for me kind of a hymn of gratitude and acceptance. So many late Beethoven works are troubled and tempestuous. This very last of his string quartets mostly has a very capricious character, very strange, almost comical at times. But in this third movement, the slow movement, we again get a kind of hymn of thanksgiving. It is in a form which, along with the great you know, traditional sonata form of exposition, development, and re recapitulation, it is, what, it is really what was Beethoven's favorite format, the theme and variations. So listen for this again, this inexpressibly warm hymn-like theme in D-flat within four graceful and gorgeously complicated variations. The form of a theme and variations in itself could not be more traditional, but of course, it's what Beethoven, who is ever the traditionalist at the same time that he is the radical, it's what Beethoven does, does with that form, which is so ineffable and extraordinary. The way that by the, by the time you're listening to the last variation, you've probably lost all sense of the bar line. Of course, Western music, Western classical music is 99% of the time is organized by measures, measure lines, bar lines. And with this slow movement, as in so much of late Beethoven, particularly in the piano sonatas and these late string quartets, you kind of lose any sense of measure or bar line. And I I invite you, I invite you to, you to yourselves get lost in this beautiful music of the most profound sense of reverie and reflection. Well, after that moment of reflection from Beethoven, and certainly in this age of COVID, there is so much for us all to be reflective about, we then go to the vigor of one of the great, great concertos by one of Beethoven's great predecessors, one of the giants of the Baroque era, the later, well, middle, early middle 18th century, I should say, the Baroque era, Johann Sebastian Bach. Just as Haydn and Mozart were the giants of the classical era near the end of the 18th century, and Beethoven and Schubert would be the titans of early Romanticism in the early 19th century, so is it that George Frederick Handel and Johann Sebastian Bach, and it must be said, um, their Italian older brother, Antonio Vivaldi, were the giants of the Baroque. I mentioned that great Italian composer, Vivaldi, because in writing the concerto we're going to hear today, his concerto in D minor, the so-called double concerto, for two violins and strings and keyboard continuo, Johann Sebastian Bach, who was, I think as you know, a North German pious Lutheran to the core, was simultaneously a great man of the world. And he assiduously followed all the latest musical developments and, and also the great traditions that came out of France, England, and most principally, Italy. J.S. Bach, again, you have this image of Bach, so serious and grave, and of course he was. He had a work ethic, which I can't, I think most of us can't begin to comprehend. But it's fair to say that Bach was just nuts about Antonio Vivaldi. He loved Vivaldi's light and bright and lovely Venetian concertos that he would, 
transcribe them into works in other mediums, other genres. He would transcribe them into works for solo organ, for example. He took Vivaldi's concerto for four violins and turned it into a concerto for four pianos. The concerto in D minor for two violins is compositionally an original work, but Bach pays unfettered homage to the great Italian Baroque tradition of the concerto in a form of three movements, fast, slow, and fast. The first movement is, it's so notable for that it follows rigorously the, the what we call the ritornello form of the, the first movement of an Italian Baroque concerto, in that you have a basic idea <clears throat> that comes back again and again and again, and which is played by the tutti ensemble, the full ensemble, and in between those utterances of the ritornello, the main idea, you have these episodes where the two soloists do their various star turns. The slow movement is, it could not be more Italian. It is a cantalena. It is this gentle song and this kind of rocking lullaby, like a triple meter within a larger four beat to the bar structure. The finale is fast and very, very rigorous, severe. But what is so extraordinary about the many extraordinary things about this really, let's say, just perfect double concerto for two violins of J.S. Bach is that Bach, with his supreme genius, brings his own Germanic rigor to this, he marries it, if, as it were, to this graceful, gorgeous Italian form of the concerto in that if you listen carefully, everything is like a fugue. You know what a fugue is? It's where one voice or instrument enters with an idea, and then a few measures later, another voice or instrument enters with the same idea, but in, different, but in a different register, and on and on and on. And of course, the fugal form, the form of counterpoint, is uh, stereotypically classical music at its most Germanic, at its most Teutonic. And the way Bach marries the Latin Italian concerto form, all that Italian Baroque gorgeousness to the more rigorous Teutonic style from the North is really something uh, beautifully unique. Again, it's a concerto in three movements, fast, slow, fast, and it gives the perfect solo vehicle. In, again, in this COVID year, where like so many orchestras all over the world, we in lacrosse are turning to our own bright shining stars from the first desks of our own uh, orchestra. It is the perfect solo vehicle for our concertmaster, Wes Luke, and our assistant concertmaster, Aaron Schwartz. And I know you're just going to be thrilled with their performance. Well, speaking of a thrilling performance, I will predict that you will be equally elated by the final work in this program, a work for which I have owned the full conductor's score since I was a college student, and I have been searching for an opportunity to perform this also, I, th I, sh I should say, uniquely great work from the earlier 20th century by another great Central European composer of genius, the Concerto Grosso, number one. Again, Concerto Grosso, that form of the old Italian Baroque of Vivaldi and Corelli and adopted by George Frederick Handel. The Concerto Grosso, number one, for string orchestra with piano obbligato by the great Swiss Jewish composer who became a great American comp composer, Ernest Bloch, B-L-O-C-H. Remember that name if it's your first encounter with the great music of this great, great composer and, and all-around musician and pedagogue, because Ernest Bloch is, along with Elgar and Sibelius and Richard Strauss and Maurice Ravel, one of the great, great musical voices in classical music of the earlier 20th century. I say piano obbligato because <clears throat> 
the piano part in this piece is very curious and, and it is actually the reason as to why it's taken me a quarter century to finally find a program for this piece because the, the solo piano part in this work is solo, but it's not quite a concerto. It's something in between a concerto and, a, and an orchestral piano part. So it's very hard to program it for that reason. And I'm so, so happy to say that for, for these performances, we have engaged Professor Christopher Atzinger from St. Olaf College up the road in Northfield. As you probably know by now, I was so, so privileged to do my work as a graduate student in one of the great, uh, what we call choir school colleges of England, King's College, Cambridge. And their Midwestern American sisters and brothers are the great Lutheran choir schools of the upper Midwest. And it's always a pleasure to, to engage one of the professors from schools like Luther College and St. Olaf College to work with us at the La Crosse Symphony. So I'm so, so thrilled that Dr. Atzinger can join us for these performances of the Ernest Bloch Concerto. As Bloch himself entitled it, it is a Concerto Grosso. He consciously recalls, now this is the early 1920s, it's a work from 1925, the spirit of the age of the Italian Baroque of the earlier 18th century. This was actually very typical amongst composers in the 1920s because after World War I, where the entire, not to be grandiose, but the entire structure of European civilization had collapsed, the general idea for composers was that you couldn't go on writing music as music had been, say, in 1900. You had to find a new voice, and there were two principal responses. One of them was atonality, total dissonance as, well, but a dissonance which had certainly had its moments of profound elegance, as typified most immortally by the composers of what we call the Second Viennese School, composers like Arnold Schoenberg and Anton von Webern, um, some of whose music I would love to bring to you in lacrosse someday. The other tack, which was taken most notably, most notably by Igor Stravinsky, was that, and many, actually many French composers living and working in Paris in the Roaring Twenties, the other tack was one of neoclassicism, where instead of looking forward like the second Viennese, Viennese school, you consciously looked backward to the classical era, the age of the Baroque, and you revived old and tried and true forms, truly the, the musical equivalent of old wine and new bottles. Ernest Bloch, by the early 1920s, had already had an incredibly um, rich and diverse musical background. He was born in, I believe it was 1890, in Geneva to Swiss Jewish parents. And Bloch is so memorable for completely and unabashedly embracing his Jewish heritage in music. In some ways, you could say that he is, to the Jewish tradition, what, say, Edvard Grieg is to the, to the Norwegians, or Sibelius was to the Finns, or, say, Antonin Dvorak had been to the Czechs a generation earlier. I think Bloch himself would ultimately say that he was a great composer first and foremost, but he would also say that he joyously celebrated his great, great Jewish musical traditions. And it's not for nothing that most of his most famous and greatest works are works that celebrate that tradition. The, I call it a concerto, but it's more like a, just a gigantic symphonic poem for cello and orchestra, Shlomo, which I really hope we'll do someday, but you have to have exactly the right cellist in the right situation. It requires a very large orchestra. Um, I've conducted it before, I'm very blessed to say, but we'll find the right setting for it here in La Crosse someday. That's one of his absolute greatest work, probably his most famous work. One of his other greatest works is his setting of the sacred service, which you do still hear uh, from time to time in performance in synagogues. It's very rare that it's performed on the concert stage. There's also a glorious 
Hebraic suite for violin and orchestra, Baal Shem, that is actually done quite frequently. Um, and then there is this, outside of the Jewish tradition, this Concerto Grosso, the first of two Concerto Grossi that he wrote, in, in order to kind of establish his bona fides as a neoclassical composer who could kind of uh, do justice to the style that was being popularized at that point by Igor Stravinsky. By this point in the early 1920s, Ernest Bloch had become an American composer. He had emigrated to the States in 1916, and by 1920, he was the founding uh, musical and executive director of the Cleveland Institute of Music. Actually, uh, we in the La Crosse Symphony can boast of several fine graduates of CIM in our string section. And Ernest Bloch was the founding director of that school. He then went on to be the director of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. In the 1930s, he briefly ventured back to his Swiss homeland and wanted to reestablish himself as a great kind of European concert composer like Elgar, Elgar or Mahler or Sibelius. But of course, the rising currents of anti-Semitism and the Nazi regime, into which, of course, Mussolini in Italy, where actually his music was quite popular, had sadly also succumbed, forced Bloch and his family to emigrate to America. He finished out his life and career in, of all places, Oregon. And I've often wondered why he settled on the West Coast. And I think as Bloch was not only so proud, so fiercely proud of his Jewish traditions as a composer, as an artist, as a humanist, I think for a person such as him to witness what had been the most advanced civilization on earth in a matter of years become the most barbaric. I've always had this feeling that he just wanted to get as far away from that as possible and became one of those celebrated West Coast emigres in mostly in California, but also in Oregon and Washington State um, by the 1940s. This Concerto Grosso, however, dates from 1925. It was his valedictory concert as the director of the Cleveland Institute of Music, um, in which he conducted the first performance of this piece. It is a work which does not get as performed as often as it should, because again, the oddity of the solo but non-concerto piano part, but is a it is a work that has always, since its first performance, been firmly in the repertoire, and I am so thrilled to bring it to you today. It is a work in the traditional four symphonic movements. There is an opening fast movement, which is so dramatic and so arresting in its basic idea that once you hear it, I swear you shall never forget it. The second movement, the slow movement, is a dirge, very tragic, um, again, a work that doesn't, if there's the one moment in this work that recalls the music of Beethoven and that hymn-like slow movement of that Opus 135 quartet, it would be this second movement of the block, this dirge. The third movement, of course, traditionally the dance movement of a symphony, he calls pastoral. And here, he actually, as the title would suggest, here he actually conjures the folk music spirit of his of the Switzerland in which he grew up. There's the this kind of the scent of Swiss mountain folk music is everywhere in this jovial and charming third movement. The last movement is a fugue. Remember J.S. Bach and his love of the fugue. In this finale, Bloch gives us a full-fledged symphonic fugue for the string instruments, and the piano. And I think it's fair to say in its rigor and in its perfection and success, Ernest Bloch here beats the Germans at their own game. So Beethoven, J.S. Bach, and Ernest Bloch, we have a magnificent short concert of music, which I just know you're going to love. It's always wonderful to be with you in lacrosse, and please, Enjoy the performance.